All right, so that's all I'm going to say today in terms of solving the energy part of the Schrodinger equation. So what we're really going to focus on is the other part of the Schrodinger equation today, which is solving for psi. So we're going to solve for psi, and before that, we're going to figure out that instead of just that one quantum number n, we're going to have a few other quantum numbers that fall out of solving the Schrodinger equation for what psi is. We're also going to talk more about what psi actually means. Uh, when we first introduced the Schrodinger equation, what I told you was think of psi as being some representation of what an electron is. We'll get more specific here, more specific even than just saying you can think of it as an orbital. We'll really think about what psi means. Uh, and in doing that, we'll also talk about the shapes of H atom wave functions specifically the shapes of orbitals, and then something called radial probability distribution, which will make sense uh, when we get to it. But as I said before that, we have some more quantum numbers to take care of, uh, because it turns out that when you solve the Schrodinger equation for psi, these other quantum numbers have to be defined. When we talked about binding energy, we just had one quantum number that came out of it, and that quantum number was n, which was our principal quantum number. And we know that n could be, could be equal to any integer value, so 1, 2, 3, all the way up to infinity. And this quantization that comes out of having n is what gives us the quantization of different energy levels. That's why we can't have a continuum of energy. We actually have those quantized points. So it turns out that n is not the only quantum number needed to describe a wave function, however. There's two more that you can see come out of it. And the first is L. And L is our angular momentum quantum number. And it's called that because it actually dictates the angular momentum that our electron has in our atom. And when we talk about L, it is a quantum number. So because it's a quantum number, we know that it can only have discrete values. It can't just be any value we want. It's very specific values. And unlike N, L can start all the way down at 0. And it increases by integer values. So we go 1, 2, 3, and all the way up. But also, unlike N, L cannot have just any value. We can't go into in to infinity. L is limited such that the highest value of L is n minus 1. We can't get any higher than that. So it would be a good question to ask, why are we limited? Clearly, there's this relationship between L and n, and we can't get any higher than n equals 1. We can actually think about why that is. And the reason is because L is our angular momentum. It describes the angular momentum of the electron. So another way to think about that is just the rotational kinetic energy of our electron. And we know that n describes the total energy, that total binding energy of the electron. So the total energy is going to be equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. So if we say that L is just talking about our kinetic energy part, our rotational kinetic energy, and we know that electrons have potential energy, then it makes sense that L, in fact, can never go higher than n. And in fact, it can't even reach n, because then we would have no potential energy at all in our electron, which is, which is not correct. So that's the second quantum number. And the third one is called m. It's also called m sub l. This is what we call the magnetic quantum number. Uh, and a more, we won't deal with the fact of it being the magnetic quantum number here. That kind of tells us the shape of the orbital or the way uh, that the electron will behave in a magnetic field. Uh, but what's more relevant to thinking about the limits of this number is that it's also the z component of the angular momentum. So since it's a component of the angular momentum, that means that it's never going to be able to go higher than L is. So it makes sense that, for example, it could start at 0 and then go all the way up to L. But since it is a component, it can have a direction, too. So it can go up between negative L and positive L. So the allowed values for m sub L are going to be negative L all the way up to 0 and then up to positive L. So if we think of just an example, we could say that for L equals 2, what would be our lowest value of m sub L? Yep. So m sub L could equal negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, or 2. So we could have five different values of m sub L. So those are our three quantum numbers. So if, in fact, 
we want to describe a wave function, we know that we need to describe it in terms of all three quantum numbers and also as a function of uh, our, three positional, our three positional factors, which are r, the radius, plus the two angles, theta and phi. So we have now a complete description of a wave function that we can talk about. So we can think about what is it that we would call the ground state wave function. We knew from Friday when we talked about energy that ground state was that n equals 1 value. That was the lowest energy. That was the most stable place for the electron to be. But now we need to talk about L and M as well. So now when we talk about a ground state in terms of a wave function, we need to talk about the wave function of 1, 0, 0, and again as a function of R, theta, and phi. So this is our complete description of the ground state, um, the ground state wave function.